we, in the cognitive enhancement session, we did talk about the regulatory issue, and it was just brought up again by our Holland comrade uh, uh, about whether to attempt to avoid the regulatory state by going outside and doing do DIY medicine of various kinds, or to engage with the regulatory state and um, attempt to legitimate uh, our research and our uh, products within the, or, you know, the products of our ambitions within um, universal healthcare systems that Europe fortunately has and hopefully America eventually will have as well. Um, and so perhaps I'll um, then address what I think some of the techno-progressive version of that program is. And I would frame the techno-progressive program as um, being more interested in engaging with the regulatory state uh, around these issues than to avoid it, um, to have a more anarchist approach to uh, being outside of it. So uh, I, I point it to some of the things that I think would ha help us in this domain. One is um, that we have to confront the role of, the restrictive role of intellectual property in uh, not only uh, drug development, but also the kind of abundant future that we imagine. Um, I think that there's a lot of utopian uh, hope that the kind of uh, freen freeness of intellectual property in the future will allow everyone to print anything they want on their magic nanoprinters, and that everyone will be equal in that opportunity. And I think if you look at the existing intellectual property regime, where that freeness of stuff uh, has basically threatened the profit-making of the film industry and the music industry, uh, and the intellectual property uh, protection regime that has arisen up to enforce those laws with quite draconian laws in various places, um, that you see that if we begin to have a future in which there's 3D printing of various kinds and the printing of, of drugs, which is the United States, 17% of our economy is around healthcare, and drugs is one of the major costs, um, that if people do start to pirate uh, this kind of intellectual property and print it themselves, we're going to have a, a major social conflict. Um, universal access to drugs, I think, uh, cannot uh, be currently imagined by this kind of piracy. Um, it's basically going to be the ac accessible to a, a black market underground. And currently, that black market underground you know, we saw with Pirate Bay um, can be easily infiltrated, shut down, uh, and put a lot of people's lives in peril. So I would just argue that um, I think it's inescapable for us to engage with the regulatory state and to engage with the question of uh, pushing back the overreach of intellectual property law, the way that uh, everything is attempted to be patented, the fact that a quarter of human genes are being patented and that uh, even European law, which um, has European conventions that recognize that the human genome is a property of all humanity, still recognizes the legitimacy of patents on human genes, which I think is just absurd. And we need to um, reassert the role of collective property, uh, restrict the length of intellectual patents, and then we also need to figure out how those things which are patented and which are going to be um, distributed through legitimate channels, how we get them to be universally accessible to everyone. So I think that's a really important uh, thing for us to eventually confront. Another thing that we discussed in the cognitive enhancement panel, which I think is central to um, a a, an engagement with the regulatory state, is the restrictions within current medical regulation on the distinction between uh, therapy and enhancement. Now, in general, uh, transhumanists are very good at uh, deconstructing that distinction and showing that there's a lot of gray areas, we generally are for enhancement, so we, we recognize that there, is, there are things in the category of enhancement or as a direction of enhancement, but we also uh, are good at pointing out the status quo bias that says, what's the difference? You know, in, in accounting, I point out to people, <clears throat> they, accounting recognizes the difference between a profit and a loss, but it doesn't call it something different if you're in debt or if you're not in debt, right? And so the therapy and enhancement distinction in medicine somehow implies that it's okay to give something uh, to somebody if they're in debt, if, they're, if they have a disability or a disease, but it's somehow a bad thing if they get the exact same benefit and they don't have a disability or disease. And I think we need to point out that that's inconsistent 
and that there's a way to do uh, quite legitimate cost-benefit accounting uh, for the benefits of various kinds of therapies that does not pay attention to that particular distinction. So uh, Anders has done work, for instance, on what if we give cognitive, what social consequences might there be if we give cognitive enhancement to everyone, and, and it might have quite legitimate benefits. So in that context, uh, you know, targeting the poor. Now, the specifically techno-progressive aspect, I think, is that there is one consequence of the therapy enhancement distinction which is important from an egalitarian point of view, and that is that um, if you only give therapies to people who are already disadvantaged, that is, people who have diseases and disabilities, you're generally making society more equal. If you make exactly the same benefit available to everyone, um, you're just moving the current distribution of uh, wealth and privilege in society up a notch, right? And uh, Nick has called that a positional advantage in some cases. So, for instance, if we came up with a drug which gave everyone height, something that I would love since I'm five foot seven, uh, and each inch of height in the United States adds a thousand dollars to a man's <laughs> annual income, um, I'm already married, but it would have increased my chances of getting married and so forth. Um, but if everyone's an inch taller, then no one's out any better off, and all the risks and benefits uh, are different if everyone gets no benefit and only risk, right? So we have to really think about the distributional consequences of various kinds of innovation. So from a techno-progressive perspective, the importance there is we want things to be universally accessible so that at least it moves, moves everybody up. We don't want it just to be accessible to the rich because then it would actually exacerbate social inequality. And this is not a novel thing. I mean, people treat this as if it's a novel question around cognitive enhancement or genetic enhancement. It's exactly the same question that we had around the digital divide. We wanted everyone to have access to this basic social good of access to information and, and computer technology. We had to figure out how do we get everyone broadband access? How do we make sure that all schools have the right kinds of computer technology and so forth? So when we come to the cognitive enhancement uh, question, yes, we have to acknowledge to people uh, it would be a bad future in which uh, only the rich had access to drugs that made them have an IQ of a million and then they become, you know, Lex Luthor and, and the world becomes a crazy place. But a uh, hundred years ago, you could have said the same thing about literacy. You could have said, look, only the rich currently know how to read and their kids are going to make more money because they will know how to read and then we're going to become two entirely different societies, Eloys and Morlocks, and the future is terrible. So let's get rid of this literacy stuff. We didn't say that because we recognized that literacy was a basic good. It was a low, low cost, high benefit good, and that if we made it universally accessible, people would generally want it for their kids and provide it for their kids. We still had to have social policy to make sure that happened, because there were people who didn't want it for their kids who were offended by it for various reasons. Um, but by making it universally accessible, we provided it to everyone. It didn't get rid of inequality in society, and there's still uh, people who are a lot more and less literate, and that still has something to do with uh, access to affluence and, and wealth in our society but it's still the better policy than if we'd said no literacy. Um, so the distributional consequences of cognitive enhancement, I think, are incredibly important. And we also addressed, I think, one of the central themes um, that we have to continue to return to as transhumanists, which is that we envision a future uh, of a post-human democracy. We envision a future polity in which we somehow not only figure out how to keep people relatively equal in some way, but part of the same political community. And we have to define what the boundaries of that community are. And we have a pretty common set of definitions that come out of Enlightenment thought that, about the psychological characteristics that we think persons might need to have. Now, that turns out to be a lot more complicated on the ground, especially when we get into artificial intelligence and future machine minds and whatnot. You, it, the, the possibility space of machine minds is enormous. But if we're just talking about cognitive enhancement, it's very hard to imagine that we're going to have a cognitive enhancement that removes the sense of self-awareness but increases their creativity or, or something that really fundamentally changes the paradigm of what we consider to be cognitive personhood. But we can imagine that we might uh, start using cognitive enhancement on animals in ways that would fundamentally challenge um, the existing kind of paradigm of who should have rights in our society. I think it should already be challenged. But I think if we start to have cognitively enhanced animals who have significantly uh, uh, human-like mental characteristics, we really will be on the edge of a, a legal and social political paradigm shift. And just yesterday, there was a, an article 
I mean, I, I mentioned yesterday that Stanford has been doing research on uh, putting human and other places putting human neuron geon, human uh, neural ge genomes in uh, animal models for a long time, and trying to think about what the ethical limits were of that. And there's been consensus statements on doing that research with primates. Just yesterday, there was an article about um, human brain organoids being implanted in um, in mice models. And again, I don't think a mice is going to have anything approaching human level cognition, but primates potentially could. Um, and I'll just say something about another aspect which we touched on with, in the cognitive enhancement panel, which is that one of the things that we can do to increase cognitive enhancement from a therapeutic point of view is anti-aging therapy. Um, Anti-age, you know, are one of the principal decline, the causes of the decline of cognitive capacity in the population, which is going to become increasingly significant in a future in which we get older and older, um, and as you get uh, about 85, it's like more than half of the folk over 85 have uh, some form of senior dementia. Um, once we get to that kind of a future, we need to make the argument for what we have called the longevity dividend, that instead of seeing the aging and graying of the population as a potential crisis for the welfare state and an in inequity, generational inequity, the shrinking number of workers supporting these old retirees, we need to argue that every senior citizen who is not in a nursing home, who is, is not significantly disabled, is, is not only not consuming massive social resources, not taking their wife or their daughter or their sister out of the labor market in order to care for them, but they are also potentially going to be able to contribute. Now, the question of whether there's going to be jobs for them to have is another one, but there's many different ways to contribute, and we need to also be thinking about a future in which our therapies become successful enough that we completely change the balance and the social contract between labor and uh, leisure and employment um, so that it doesn't require us to say you have to get rid of the retirement age because all these seniors are now healthy and they have to go out and find jobs in this crazy labor market where the robots have actually eaten all the jobs and then we have this dystopian nightmare. We have to have a new social contract in which there's lifelong uh, learning, in which there's a universal basic income that allows people to uh, have uh, an equitable uh, chance at life from the get-go, so that it's not just seniors who get pensions, but everybody gets a pension for their entire life. So I think there's a lot of things in our Balawick that uh, touch on the cognitive enhancement uh, domain. One more thing that we did touch on. I think our thorniest uh, outreach effort and, and one of our most persistent um, uh, reputational crises is about uh, the link to eugenics and our relationship with the disability rights community. And we need to uh, be very proactive in trying to reach out to and build um, uh, a discourse around disability that is um, acknowledge, sympathetic to and acknowledges the concerns that people in the disability rights community have, but is still forthright about what is fundamentally the consensus in the entire world. There is no health department in the entire world that says, next year our plan for the population is for there to be the same amount of disability or more disability, right? If the, if the disability right, the extreme disability rights argument was correct, that you need to have X number of people with X disability in society for people with disabilities to have rights, then you would have a social policy that says, well, we can't dis you know, have fewer people with those disabilities. In fact, we should encourage more of those people with disabilities in order to have disability rights. That's insane, right? It's, it's also insane around gender selection, but I'll leave that off the table. But um, we need to be able to say, look, everybody and every health policy in the world agrees that we want the next generation to be more able to walk, more able to see, more able to hear, more able to think, all the goods that we imagine a flourishing life needs. And that society is consistent with one in which people who have disabilities, including cognitive disabilities, have the full enablement, enablement that we are working for through our technological ambitions to have the fullest life that they possibly can. And yes, we want them to have the option to overcome their disability, but if they choose not, them not to, or to go in some different direction and do something with their disability that we can't even imagine yet, we want that to be an option as well. But we want to have a future in which every child has the fullest capabilities possible. And around cognitive disability, that's especially difficult. It's a very difficult conversation to have with the parents of folks with Downs, or with people with Downs. So, um, 
at any rate, I think we've got a lot of issues on our plate, and the cognitive enhancement uh, debate raises those policy questions in very fundamental ways.